my pleasure to welcome everyone to our second webinar in the series, which has been jointly organized by Research Impact Canada and our colleagues in the UK from the University's Policy Engagement Network, or UPEN. And we will be talk um, talking with a fabulous panelist today about policy and societal impact as an institutional mission. Um, I'm going to start out by apologizing that we're not able to offer simultaneous translation today because of an issue with the Zoom license that uh, we, we have at York University. So our apologies. Um, merci, vous voulez poser des questions en français. Nous avons le, uh, le capacité um, uh, for translation. Merci, Iman. So to please do, if, as you have questions, you can type, um, or I'm checking, Iman if, um, and Sandy, if people will be able to raise their hand, can we unmute them for questions? Yes, we can. And they can also share their questions in the Q&A section. And the panelists have the ability to answer them while chatting in the Q&A um, section of the webinar. Hello, merci. Merci à tous. So I am one of your hosts and your moderators today. Oh, uh, my name is David Phipps. I am a settler born in England to white parents. We emigrated to this land that some people call Canada when I was two years old. I live with my husband in Toronto, which is on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis, and the current treaty holders of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And these are the territories that I find myself on today. For those of you who are in Canada and anywhere else in the world where there are a tradition of acknowledging Indigenous peoples and territories, I uh, hope you have this opportunity to take the chance to think about where you uh, live, work, and play on these lands. I work at York University in Toronto as the Assistant Vice President Research Strategy and Impact, and I am, my funnest part of the job is I am the Network Director for Research Impact Canada. And Justin, my colleague from UPenn, I'll just turn it over to you to introduce yourself, please. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Justin Fisher, and I'm Professor of Political Science and Director of Brunel Public Policy at Brunel University London. Uh, and as David said, I'm a member of UPenn, the UK Universities Policy Engagement Network, where I sit on the International Subcommittee. Uh, and this is part of our activities, our relationship with Research Impact Canada. So uh, over to you, Amen. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so just other items to cover on the housekeeping. Uh, we have enabled closed captioning where you will still see English subtitles at the bottom of your screen. So you can access that by pressing on the live transcript button. If you have any questions during this webinar, as I said, there may be some time at the end for the questions for the Q&A. Otherwise, you can just type down your questions in the Q&A section. And yes, we will be recording this session and it will be available, uh, made available on Research Impact Canada's website afterwards. Now, starting with introducing our wonderful panelists, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Marina, Dr. Marina Alto is the Impact Development Manager for Policy Education at the University of Exeter, UK, leading on the provision of policy engagement support and training to academics across all disciplines. She's an active member of the UPEN and the key professional body Praxis URL at, as well as the chair of the UPEN Subcommittee on Policy Engagement for Arts and Humanities. She's interested in exploring how to promote diversity and inclusivity in academic policy engagement and how to effectively measure policy impact. Welcome on board, Marina. Looking forward to thank, hearing from you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining for having me. There is also, we have with us today, uh, Rebecca Coho. Rebecca is the manager of public engagement at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, leading the Office of Public Engagement's programming and evaluation activities. She helps develop and launch Memorial's public engagement strategy, Canada's only Senate approved public engagement strategy, and is one of the organizers of committed to place leading approved public uh, leading uh, engaged university to support thriving communities and, and regions. Uh, she's a senior executive level at training program university for university leaders. Rebecca also co-hosted Rural Routes, a podcast and a show exploring what rural means in the 21st century. She's particularly interested in the impact of place on public engagement and is about to start the planning process for the next phase of Memorial Public Engagement Strategy. Welcome, Rebecca. 
Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Great to see you as well. Uh, finally, we have with us today jo Julia Johnson, who is a, a policy officer at Policy Leads. Policy Leads is a policy engagement hub for the University of Leeds, situated within the New Horizons Institute, which looks to join up researchers to people with real world challenges. It works to connect researchers and policy professionals in order to inform policy at local, national, and international level. Prior to joining Policy Leads, Juliet Johnson uh, worked as a research project manager on large interdisciplinary and multi-sector projects. This included supporting their engagement with, business, with businesses, policy professionals, and the public. Her background is in science communication, working in science, television, and multimedia before joining the University of Leeds in 2006. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you very much. Moving Great, thank you. thank you so much, Iman. I really appreciate that. Justin, um, some opening remarks from you, Penn, please. Thank you. Um, so we, our, our fabulous panel today are going to look at policy engagement and societal impact. And we're particularly interested in their reflections uh, on three things. Uh, what works? What might you do differently if you had your time again? And how the strategic mission of your institution can help or even hinder you in terms of developing effective policy engagement uh, at your institution. So David, a few final remarks before we get going. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be working with you. Just a, a little bit of context, because you'll be hearing it from our UK colleagues about the research excellence framework and some of the roles that policy engagement or engagement between universities and policy makers um, can help towards the REF. Canada doesn't have a REF. It right? doesn't have any form of, um, of systematic um, impact assessment. So uh, I am personally delighted at that. However, it does frame our context that we are not, um, we are not assessment driven as the UK um, does think about assessment when it also thinks about impact. So um, as the Canadians hear some of our UK colleagues talk about, um, you know, about REF, um, we'll just be able to interpret some of that and, and maybe there'll be a separate conversation or questions where we can think about REF and think about impact assessment um, as well as about creating impacts on policies. So Justin, that's uh, all I had. Um, anything more before we turn it over to our panels, panelists? No, I think uh, let's let's hear from the panelists. Uh, so, uh, our first uh, speaker today is Marina. So, over to you, Marina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin and David, for having me, and um, you, Penn, and Rick in general. Uh, my name is Marina. Uh, I'm an impact and partnership developer and manager at the University of Exeter, um, and I am also the lead for Policy Exeter, uh, which is our university's policy engagement initiative. Um, policy Exeter started almost three years ago now. Um, and it started as a collaborative effort of a few academics, um, mainly in the politics department, um, and a few of us um, biz, um, policy, um, sorry, uh, knowledge exchange professionals um, in, in our department. Um, it's changed a lot and it's evolved a lot uh, through the years and indeed it's still changing. I think one, that's one of the uh, nicest thing about working in this space. It's definitely um, up and coming and, and growing space. Um, but um, it started because we were faced with the, um, with the understanding that a lot of our other universities um, around us were having policy policy initiatives, and we were thinking, should we do the same? Um, so if you're here today, you might be in the same position that we were in three years ago. You might be thinking, everyone's having these policy initiative, policy engagement initiatives, institutes, um, should we do the same? And if we do, then where do we start? Uh, and in order to answer that question, I would like to take a, a, actually a couple of steps back uh, because um, I'd like to recognize the fact that at least in the UK, um, over the past years, universities have really improved quite a lot um, when it comes to external engagement. But that has been primarily, and that's from what I've seen, um, business engagement. Um, policy engagement, on the other hand, is still a bit of a very kind of gray up and coming, as I said, very fuzzy area. And um, and I think that's down to, for us at least, three main reasons. And this is, by the way, 100% my opinion. You're more than welcome to, <laughs> um, to, to disagree with me. And I'll be very happy to, to hear your thoughts as well. Um, but, but from my point of view, I think there's three main reasons. Um, one of it is that policy engagement um, has very different timelines for any ty other type of external engagement. Um, if you're thinking of it compared to 
say, um, bringing a product to market or delivering or developing a service. Um, the timeline for policy engagement is extremely long. And I always describe it to academics as it's a marathon and not a sprint. And it's very uncertain as to when opportunities will crop up. Um, the second um, the second reason uh, is that um, at least for a good chunk of policy engagement, um, it doesn't bring in money, <laughs> at least not directly. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, and then the third reason, uh, which is specifically relevant for us um, being in Exeter, which is in the um, southwest of England um, and two hours by train um, to the capital, um, is that we've got a big geographical di distance between us and the policy area. Um, so if you're familiar with the UK landscape, you'll know that policymakers um, live and work in London most of the time. Um, and uh, they often talk to people in London, universities in London. Um, they sometimes go as far as extend into what we call the Golden Triangle, which is London, um, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, but it's very difficult to kind of penetrate that, that circle. So as a, result of, as a result of that, I think policy engagement has a specific friction to it uh, which sees so many different actors um actors so uh, with with different needs and different wants so you 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 have policy makers um who want uh, sound evidence um they want it now they want it yesterday if possible <laughs> you have uh, policy um academics um that want to engage in these spaces but often don't have the time and resources and you want to you have universities um they want um, academics to do a lot of teaching and um, are a bit reluctant in giving away time and resources. So there's a lot of, of different players um, in this space, which I think make it a very, very challenging space to, to kind of manage. Um, but I do believe that universities have a unique um, place and position um, in, in so that they can be brakes, but they can also be accelerators. And I think they should be actually accelerators in this space. Um, uh, David mentioned REF, um, and uh, that's a national assessment that we, all universities in the UK have to undergo every six or seven years. Um, and um, I, I would like to mention that because I think that um, there's definitely been, or at least I've been able to observe a bit of a shift, especially with the last round of REF, which was in 2020, 2021. Um, um, a bit of a shift um, from short-term thinking. Um, so, is this project going to bring in money? Is going to is it going to bring in reputational benefits for the university um, this year? Um, to a little bit more like long-term thinking and long-term rewards, um, and that is because um, universities do get um, funding from REF as a result of having. Um, good uh, four-star impact case studies or four-star impact. Um, and although I um, don't I think this kind of approach is still a little bit problematic, and I'll expand on that on a, in a second. I do think that this shift um, from um, short-term thinking to longer-term thinking um, has been really, really useful, um, and I think it should be leveraged um, to promote policy impact and social impact as an institutional mission. Uh, so now, for example, we're thinking not not only in is this going to bringing money, but is this going to be a four-star impact case study in, in six or seven years? Um, and I think universities, as well as external bodies like UPenn, for example, um, really have um, a calling in this space and have a, a mission in this space, which is um, to be able to broker uh, relationships and policy engagement, to be able to facilitate these interactions and to give academics the space and the resources they need to succeed in these en endeavors. Um, so going back to the original question, which is um, uh, about where, why we started this initiative and, and, and how we did it. Um, we, um, I, th we th I think poly having a policy initiative has been really, really crucial in the sense that it really helped us centralize our efforts and make no mistake, this is an ongoing process. It's not done and dusted by any means, um, but it, it gives us the space to be able to centralize our contacts, um, mental, manage relationships and offer training, um, offer peer learning. Um, that's Those are some, some of the things that we did that I think we, we think are being quite successful. Uh, and in general, we have the aim of creating a space that is a bit of a clearinghouse um, that can accept requests and um, can answer questions coming from both academics and, um, and policymakers and anyone else uh, in this space. Um, and going forward, I think we'll be very, very keen to um, leverage some of the resources that we think are still a bit untapped. So for example, our brilliant PGR staff and our alumni relations. And so these are all spaces that we are kind of investigating at the moment. Um, 
but there is a big shift that I think I would like to s still see, um, which is what I mentioned before. Um, and I think if we really want to kind of push social impact um, and policy impact as an institutional uh, mission, we really need to move beyond um, income driven uh, impact measures. Uh, so I would really like to be able to see sector wide impact measures that go um, beyond money. Um, I think that is absolutely crucial when we when we talk about um, policy engagement. Um, I hope I didn't take up too much time. I didn't really tie myself, sorry. Um, but that was, that was th these are my thoughts. Again, very happy uh, to take any comments or anything like that um, at the end. Terrific. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Marina. Uh, and some really interesting things to think about in, in the Q&A uh, a little bit later on. So, so we're going to move on to our next speaker now. So, uh, Rebecca, over to you. All right. So, uh, I actually am going to give a little bit of context just for my institution because I do think it is quite relevant in the way that we approach uh, both the policy and also sort of our general public engagement work. Uh, we're a comprehensive university in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Uh, I'm intrigued, uh, you know, I think context matters because, uh, you know, we also think of ourselves as being somewhat on the margins, kind of in the same way that Marina mentioned, but we're actually a three hour flight from the center. So we're a long ways from our federal government, but we are very, very close with our provincial government, which adds a, a whole different level uh, to the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, 18,000 students, six campuses, one's in the UK, in fact, uh, and we have quite a small population, only about 550,000 people in the province, and about half of those people are in a metro area, and all of the rest are dispersed across our very large landmass coastal, island, subarctic, arctic regions. Uh, we have a big focus on oceans, up to four, over 40% of all of our research is oceans focused with much higher percentages in, in certain areas, rural remote medicine, regional development, genetics, folklore, and public engagement. Uh, the thing that's really interesting, I think, in terms of our context in, in terms of this topic is that we really do have that idea of uh, impact built into most of our institutional documents and, and, in fact, into our history. We're a living memorial to the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who died in the two world wars. And the idea of this special obligation to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador is really baked into everything that we do and always has been. Uh, and we're going on 100 years now. Uh, public engagement is actually within our, our academic mission uh, alongside research and teaching and learning. And we are the only university in the province. So we do have this weirdly close relationship with our provincial government uh, in terms of medicine and our healthcare system, our K-12 education system, and various different uh, elements related to oceans and fisheries. It's basically like this. Uh, and also, we have this really strong sense of ownership as a result. So, you know, it's not unusual if we were listening to a call-in show on the radio in the province for someone to say, uh, you know, the folks at Memorial should be doing something about this. Uh, so there is that sense of expectation as well. So basically, we're a research-intensive university, but with this really strong public engagement mandate, which is quite a balance sometimes. Um, so I do want to get into sort of how we do things. Uh, we have always had a history of this sort of engaged approach to work, but until about a decade ago, we actually didn't have any pan-university coordination on it. Uh, it took a president from the prairies coming in and saying, listen, you've got frameworks for research and teaching and learning. If public engagement is part of our academic mission, why haven't we placed it on that same level? So from there, we took a major process, significant amount of consultation inside the university and outside the university, absolutely including both federal and provincial government elements as well. Final result was our framework, this little blue book. It guides pretty much everything we do. And it was recently highlighted as a best practice by the OECD. Uh, we're about 10 years out from that. And we've actually just completed a fairly comprehensive evaluation of the impact that this document has actually had on our work. We haven't released the uh, evaluation yet, but I'm gonna be using some of the results to kind of illustrate my points. Okay. So this is our definition at, at Memorial that we use. Uh, and I think it's really, really important for inst institutions to be very clear about what they mean when they're talking about this type of public engagement. 
Uh, I want to highlight that at Memorial, this work always furthers our academic mission. Uh, and also, I want to highlight the, the ideas of mutual respect, the mutual contributions, and the mutual benefits for all participants. This definition is used across the board for all of that public engagement work. So community groups and not-for-profits, but also industry groups, and certainly also our connections with governments, including provincial, federal, indigenous. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention, I will frame my comments more in terms of societal impact rather than policy engagement specifically. That really isn't a term that we use, although we're certainly doing the work within our portfolio. Um, so I'm just going to move right on to the things that I've learned. <laughs> and, you know, Marina kind of alluded to this, too. You really do have to have a clear plan. Universities are big and complicated entities. Um, and having that strategy with the vision, the definition, the goals uh, has been really useful to us on a number of fronts. Um, right off the bat, that provides clarity about what we mean. And, you know, you don't have to define research or teaching and learning in a higher education system. Uh, but we're still kind of at that phase in terms of the public engagement side of things, particularly in Canada, uh, without some of the sort of oversight happening that is happening in the UK, you know, we still sometimes are kind of doing a sell job on this stuff. Uh, so having this plan also has been really good for legitimizing and prioritizing the work that's happening. So it's meant that folks who are doing engaged work feel like they can move ahead in it, but it's also kind of opened the door for folks to step into it. And I also think it's really important in that uh, in terms of like the planning and structure of universities sometimes isn't made to fit this kind of different type of practice. And having that plan empowers staff in, you know, a research office, for example, to be able to actually say, hmm, I guess I do need to find a way to make this different approach to partnership actually happen. Uh, and out, another thing that I've found is that it embeds the public engagement um, within the structures of the university. So we've got a new president as compared to the one who I mentioned earlier, but we had very little trouble throughout that transition. The public engagement work just kind of continued on because it's been embedded. Uh, and then also the last point I would make there is just the fact that it really does serve um, as sort of an external marker that this is something that's valued here. And that is very important when it comes to our relationships with governments. Uh, and it means that they will take us to task and they'll say, listen, you say you're doing this, let's do it. It also is an excellent tool when, when it comes to recruiting like-minded faculty and staff to work at the university. And I know uh, it may be hard to believe that anyone actually cares about yet another university institutional document. I mean, what could be more boring, honestly? But our evaluation results actually really suggested that this has made a difference. Uh, when we asked faculty and staff whether they were aware of the contents of our framework, 81% said that they were. And when we asked whether they felt that the public engagement framework had been beneficial to PE at Memorial, 71% said it had. And so those are pretty excellent reviews for an institutional document. Okay, so the next one, nobody really owns PE. They shouldn't. A uh, big lesson has been that even though we're the Office of Public Engagement um, and we do have that government relations function as well, it doesn't mean that we have to have our fingers in every single thing that's happening. Uh, lots of people are doing this work on their own and have been for years. Um, the last thing that we would want to do is get in their way and present new hurdles. Uh, we know that this type of work takes more time. It's relationship-based. Uh, like Marina said, it Often public engagement is not a sprint uh, and uh, we don't wanna introduce bureaucracy where we don't need to. Um, so, you know, we're not the doers of PE. I really see as us as being there to support what's going on and then to get out of the way so that students, faculty and staff can actually get the work happening. We really are an academic support unit primarily. So on the micro level, in our experience, this has looked like offering funding programs that start from very small amounts for relationship building and go all the way up to postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, and in, in the government context, for example, we have many, many projects that we've funded over the years where a government department is actually the external partner on a project, be it a relationship building element or a, a much more uh, established and, uh, you know, fulsome project. Um, 
so we do the funding stuff. Uh, education and training is key. Um, we do actually operate a community of practice, including internal and external folks. We've got uh, folks from all kinds of different areas, industry, not-for-profits, governments, et cetera, who all participate together in that. And then on the macro level, it's it's been a lot of advocacy for public engagement within university processes. So decision-making, strategy, et cetera. Stuff like what we're doing here today is part of it, interacting with other organizations who are working on the sort of broader public engagement and policy engagement issues. Uh, and then also something that we've worked on is integrating this sort of public engagement perspective into our strate strategic external relations work, including the government relations. This is my final point. This one's really exciting to me. This was some of the most you know, excellent results that we got from our survey. Uh, you know, we heard a lot about the barriers that exist to doing this type of work, and I'm sure they are probably quite consistent across Canadian and UK universities. Uh, but what we heard is that people really, really care about this work, even people who aren't doing it. It still matters to them. 88% uh, of faculty and 81% of our staff agree that there's a high need for public engagement at Memorial. 75% of faculty and 65% of staff said they would personally like to be doing more. Uh, so that's an opportunity right there. Right there. Uh, we also asked them about the motivations, and this also was really inspiring stuff. Um, contribute to the community slash province was number one. Number two uh, for the faculty was a sense of moral responsibility. And number three was expand the, sorry, number two for the staff was expand the university's community. So those are almost intrinsically motivating uh, factors. And, you know, it's clear that folks really do want to make a positive difference and, and for their work to have an impact like now and in the future. So I'm just going to leave a couple of those sort of positive uh Final quotations. There were negative ones in there too, but um, I just think this is kind of a you know a, a high level sort of look at what this means within people's work. Uh, and yeah, I, I do like to end on a high note. Although I'm sure we can get into lots of the, the, <laughs> the less appealing stuff in the conversation as well. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, just before uh, we invite Juliet to give her remarks, uh, uh, Rebecca raised an important other differentiator between UPenn and uh, Research Impact Canada, was that uh, policy engagement is one of the activities that Research Impact Canada supports, but we also support um, knowledge mobilization, public and community engagement, patient and public involvement, so more broadly across the board. And so that's another place where we can learn a lot from UPenn, which has a more of a specific focus on the policy engagement. So given that, Juliet, I invite you to provide your remarks. Thank you very much. I hope you can. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give a slightly different um, uh, presentation to the last two people. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, who Policy Leads is uh, and then give a few examples of uh, what we've been doing at uh, Leeds, uh, in particularly looking at the in, uh, importance of the institutional environment uh, for facilitating engagement. So for those of you that don't know, the University of Leeds is a large research intensive university in the north of England. Uh, we have uh, around 9,000 staff and uh, just under 40,000 uh, students. Um, so Policy Leads was established in uh, 2020 uh, with the aim at uh, increasing the capacity of uh, University of Leeds researchers to engage with policy. And we very much support with a sort of grassroots um, kind of uh, engagement. So supporting researchers uh, by uh, providing small pots of money, uh, by doing things like training, uh, by connecting people uh, across the university and externally uh, and providing opportunities. Um, but I wanted to concentrate today on uh, more of the institutional setting and how that's helped. Uh, so the University of Leeds academic strategy makes it very clear that we would like to make a difference in the world. And we have three overarching elements that contribute towards that. Uh, the first of all is community, and that's building community both within the university, but also embedding ourselves in uh, local and global communities. Uh, we also are looking to develop our culture uh, to be one of collaboration rather than competition. 
And we also very much uh, explicitly want to make an impact uh, and to do that, look at the needs of uh, local and global populations so that our research is uh, aligned with um, something that can maximise our chances of actually making a difference. So that's sort of setting up the, the um, uh, environment for what we actually do. Uh, and I'm just like to share a couple of examples of how that works uh, uh, over in practice. So the first uh, is our working with uh, Leeds City Council. Uh, so again, in 2020, uh, the Leeds Social Sciences Institute and the university did a review of bilateral collaborations between the university and the council and found that we'd already had 118 projects uh, between the two organisations in the previous five years, uh, which shows there's a fantastic amount of activity already happening. Um, Two things we did uh, particularly note was that uh, the collaborations are often between individual uh, groups of researchers and um, policy teams. Um, so it was quite difficult to actually see over the entire um, collaboration what was happening, which meant that there's very high chance that we're not actually mobilizing the full force of the university to address the needs of the council. Uh, and in in addition, that it can often be quite difficult um, as uh, from either side of the relationship um, to actually set up new collaborations and navigate the, the different structures at the council and university. So to try and address that, we've now got a uh, reference group that involves uh, senior members of the council and the university to try and provide some strategic direction for the collaboration. Uh, and we have a regular liaison group that uh, uh, meets on a regular basis to um, forward uh, discussions between the two organisations uh, and to try and um, uh, actually direct some of the collaboration. So one of the things we've been doing is trialling, uh, developing areas of research interest for the council uh, based on their current priorities in the areas of culture, digital food and inclusive growth. Uh, so over the summer period, we held a series of focus groups, uh, inviting uh, policy leads from the council and then uh, key researchers who had a good overview of those areas in the university, uh, and then really try to tease out the, the needs of the council in those particular areas. Uh, to then stimulate some activity to address some of the identified needs, we've uh, ring fence some of the uh, Research England policy support funding that we've been given this year uh, and put out an open call to uh, invite researchers to um, put forward uh, proposals to address some of these needs. So we received a lot of interest to that uh, and we're just uh, working our way through that and got the panel meeting tomorrow to actually make some decisions. So I'm very hopeful that we'll definitely uh, address uh, and possibly exceed our original ambition. Um, but this is very much a starting point. Um, we don't, uh, <laughs> we certainly don't have enough money to address all the council needs, that's for sure. Uh, but it's more of a question of opening up that conversation uh, and being uh, very clear about what the needs are so that researchers can then uh, start new conversations and they can also look to see how they can address some of those needs as part of their wider work. So the second uh, example I wanted to bring um, was our involvement in the Place-Based Economic Recovery Network, or PERN, uh, which was established in 2020 to support the West Yorkshire Combined Authority um, and other public bodies in the West Yorkshire area uh, with their economic recovery after COVID. So the, it's an academic-led network involving all the West Yorkshire universities uh, and then has been supported by uh, a policy fellow from uh, the CAPE programme um, uh, who's acted as a uh, conduit between West Yorkshire Combined Authority and the West Yorkshire uh, University Network to try and mobilise um, research from those universities to address the priorities of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Uh, so this uh, expanded when Tracy Brabin was appointed as West Yorkshire Mayor to also starting to address some of the mayoral priorities that she had put forward. 
Uh, and uh, we found that this has been quite an effective uh, mechanism and uh, in fact so much so that uh, we have uh, announced uh, this week uh, the uh, Yorkshire and Humber Policy Engagement Research Network or YPERN, uh, which will be beginning uh, in the new year. Uh, and that is uh, involving the Yorkshire Universities Group uh, and 22 local authorities and two mayoral combined authorities. Um, and we'll be looking to see if the model that we've um, been developing in West Yorkshire can then also apply in other parts of Yorkshire, so North Yorkshire, for example, is a much more rural area. Uh, and also to see if there's a, a way of being able to share learning between those different uh, areas. So it's very much a question of, um, you know, it, the collaboration is absolutely crucial to this and the universities are better together uh, to be able to uh, address those uh, policy needs. Uh, whereas if we're all vying for each of those uh, authorities' attention, um, that would be uh, a much less effective way of doing it. Uh, so switching again slightly to a different example, um, just wanted to share our recent uh, Engage for Impact Awards. So uh, as um, I think Marino uh, mentioned right at the beginning, uh, journey to impact can be a very long one. Uh, and it's also can often be a, very much a team sport with lots of researchers, but also professional staff involved. Um, and, you know, the actual um, REF process rewards the end point but that can be many years and uh, not necessarily guaranteed, especially with policy um, requiring a certain amount of timing, whether it's, it's uh, possible is another matter. So we wanted to celebrate uh, the steps that uh, researchers and the efforts that uh, our, our staff are making along that road to impact. Uh, and so brought these uh, awards in this year. So this is our first year, as I said, uh, and uh, we have generated a large amount of interest in uh, the, um, the work that's ongoing across the university uh, and a lot of the researchers felt it very uh, important to have that recognition and reward for, for the engagement that they've been pursuing so far. Um, there's also the feedback from the panel uh, has been very uh, influential in uh, those uh, awardees actually planning their next steps uh, and in fact one of the uh, awards um, uh, which was for the societal uh, difference uh, actually has um, highlighted a, a policy uh, engagement as their next step. So that's what they're looking to do now. So I think the things that I would like you to take home from what I've said so far is I think the institution um, setting is going to be really important to sending out the signal that this is an area that they, they really want to pursue uh, and to sort of legitimise people putting time into it. And I think uh, collaboration and addressing the needs of partners is a very important route to impact, um, but also uh, finding ways of being inclusive uh, and then actually opening up conversations is also important. Uh, and also, uh, finally, um, impact can be a long time and take a lot of effort, so we should recognise and celebrate those who have taken the journey. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Juliet. Um, so uh, if I could get all the, the speakers back, um, we have uh, a question already uh, from the floor. Uh, and if uh, any colleagues have any uh, questions that they'd like to, to ask, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, so we have a question here from, from Ida, and I Ida is from Denmark, uh, uh, compliments the speakers on the excellent points. And Ida asks, uh, do any of you have advice on how best to support researchers in communicating in a, in a language that's understood by the general public? Uh, so I think that's a, that's a very, very good point. Um, and perhaps who'd like to kick off uh, from, from, from our three speakers? Uh, shall I? Yeah, Julia. Jump in. Uh, Is that okay? Um, it's in a very interesting question to me because, uh, as I uh, said in my biography, um, uh, my my background is partly in science communication, um, and I do think that this is uh, something that I found that a large number of the researchers that we we support are very nervous about doing, 
Um, so uh, certainly um, what I have found on uh, the work I do in policy leads is sometimes it's it can actually just be as much as handholding exercise in terms of actually getting uh, people to develop the confidence, but also uh, making them understand the structure uh, of different communication styles. So uh, obviously um, they're very used to writing in an academic way where you have an abstract and then you have an introduction and then you take some time to set up the context and the methods and stuff like that. Whereas actually there are other structures out there. So um, when we do policy brief, we basically uh, use a news structure uh, that assumes that at any point in time, people might stop reading and that you'll lose their attention. And thus, so you do a sense check of, OK, does my title tell you enough to get you to the next stage? OK, does my my sort of uh, summary give you all the key points that you would actually be able to tell people what this brief is about and what the action points are and why is it relevant to me? And, and then sort of keep on going down. So, I mean, if you read news articles occasionally, you'll catch them where they literally cut the paragraph off halfway through because they've just flowed the text in and then just not worried about the bottom. And, you know, that's that's the kind of thing. It's just not leaving your key messages to the end, very much thinking about who is the audience and how is this information relevant to them and how are they going to actually be able to action it. And, you know, sort of those sort of things. So it's it's to a certain extent is teaching a certain amount of empathy uh, and then always get it sent to check by somebody who doesn't know the field because it is so difficult when you've been embedded in an area that you just don't know what other people don't know. You know, you can't remember when you first learned something. So um, just having somebody sent to check it from, you know, somewhere like policy leads where you're looking across different things can really help. Is it okay for me to go? So, sorry, I was on mute, Rebecca. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I just, I, I totally agree with what Juliet said. I think that, uh, and I know the sort of the, the relationship between staff and faculty is something that maybe we'll get to a little bit more in our conversations as well. But I think that as much as I was like, well, always keep it to the academic mission, I think it's really important that uh, faculty feel like they can go to staff and get this support as well. It is funny that, Julia, that you say you come from a science communications background. I do think that a lot of people who are working in this area have some degree of communications experience. So I think that leaning on staff is important and, and giving staff the opportunity to develop creative ways to support those faculty members is key, uh, you know, and, and finding ways to share information that aren't just focused on, you know, being able to give a good interview live on the spot. Some people are just never going to get there, and that's okay. Uh, one example that we have at Memorial is we have YAFL, which is our research re repository, and it is a uh, very searchable sort of database of work that's happening at Memorial. And part of that is uh, we call them lay summaries. So it's literally a paragraph about your project that speaks in the way that we all speak and that people can go and look at, understand what you're saying. And if they want to go deeper, they can connect to you. So finding those kinds of tools for different types of communication, I think is really useful as well. Great, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, just to, if uh, people can see the chat, David has very helpfully uh, put a link to a paper uh, that they have from York on writing clear language uh, research summaries of peer reviewed publications. So I think that's, uh, that's great. And if, if people could uh, download it, I'm sure they'd find it very helpful. Um, Marina, anything to add on, on, on um, clear language? Yeah, I think that's absolutely central. And that's something that comes up again and again when we talk to, to researchers. And oftentimes when you kind of present them with uh, uh, something that maybe you've written or you've worked with them uh, on writing and they go, yes, absolutely. I, I didn't really think about this. I didn't really think that people wouldn't know this acronym. Um, and because, as we said, the, it's so difficult to, to know what you don't, what people don't know when you're so embedded in that. Um, so I would definitely echo what um, Julia and Rebecca have said, um, invest in training and invest in creating resources. Uh, we've got how-to guides, we've got templates. It's really easy if you can if present them with a template that says this is what you need to consider um and just like uh, work with them on it um and and having someone else and encouraging um 
them to have someone else ch sense check it, someone from a different discipline. Um, those are all, all helpful things. But yeah, I think Judy and Rebecca have covered everything. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks. Uh, now, don't go away, uh, because um, while we're waiting for other questions in the Q&A, um, we've got some broad ones to, to think about. Um, we've heard a lot from all three speakers about what really works in their own institutions. Um, we've had some fantastic ideas that I'm sure many of us will, will, will draw upon. But I'd also like to um, I'd ask the speakers to think about what hasn't worked or what they would do differently. Um, and what particular tips they would like to add uh, to, to really make uh, policy and society engagement work beyond what they've said in their presentations. So, so who, who'd like to kick off from our speakers? Marina? I'm happy to go first in terms of, um, um, I guess, what hasn't, what hasn't worked. Um, over the past years, we've kind of been investing quite a lot in our training. Um, and it's been a bit of a suck it and see experience in the sense that we've we've decided to experiment and and, and provide um, researchers with lots of different types of trainings. And we noticed that the ones that didn't work um, were the ones that almost went into too much detail. Um, so I think um, kind of Rebecca touched on it earlier with the question. Um, we can't expect academics um, to do everything and to do policy engagement fully 100% on top of their job. That is our job. Um, so overloading them with information um, about the details of contractual like elements in, in contra research or consultancy or things like that, which is what we did, <laughs> didn't work. Um, so um, I think it's really important to understand where they, they have a clear expectation of what they can contribute and, and have a clear demarcation of where their work stops and what our work stops. Um, so I think that that would be the key key learning for me. Something, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Rebecca. Good. Right. Uh, yeah, so and I don't have I don't think I have a solution to the sort of thing that hasn't worked that well that I'm going to mention but uh, you know we've just been totally embedded in this evaluation process and it has really made it clear to me how we have had so much more success on the research and public engagement and policy engagement side and how we have struggled more on the teaching and learning and on the student side in particular. Uh, it is challenging, you know, I, I'll go back to it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So when you have students who are in your institution for four years, how do you give them those meaningful opportunities for that type of engagement, uh, knowing that, you know, they're there and then they're gone. Uh, so that's been a really big challenge. And I'd actually be very happy to hear from any of the other panelists if they've had success. We've just found that the even the systems related to students are quite siloed across the university. And uh, it's been very hard to get everyone sort of pointed in the same direction on this stuff. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Juliet, anything to, to add on key tips? Uh, key tips. Yeah, um, possibly better to, to focus on the positive. Um, so uh, I started um, Policy Leads in April 2020, which was, uh, for those in the UK will recognise as literally just as we went into lockdown with COVID. Um, and uh, so I suppose my top tip would be don't start in a, in a pandemic. <laughs> um, then uh, certainly uh, we we had a lot of oxygen sucked out of the room as everybody scrambled. Uh, and there was a lot of um, problems with lack of capacity uh, in terms of the researchers. Um, I think we're only just starting to see people um, uh, regain the ability to actually do things on top of uh, juggling teaching and uh, just keep, trying to keep their head above water. Um, so we're still very much in the learning curve. Um, and I, again, I think um, part of the learning I'm doing is that uh, we were set up very much as a bottom up kind of um, uh, route in terms of supporting the coal fund with the researchers. But I suppose what I'm discovering is very much the need to to also embed myself in the institutional structures to actually um, have the visibility to be able to get to the people I need to help. Great, yes, uh, visibility across the institution, I think is really, really important. Um, David, over to you. We've got some uh, more questions in the Q&A. 
Great. Th thanks, Justin. Just one quick little um, Rick Upen moment is one thing we do, we have an annual meeting for the members of Research Impact Canada. And one thing we do is we feature an opportunity to share what hasn't worked. Like we share our failures with the group. And I just think that we, we so often want to talk about our successes, but as a network, we provide opportunity for sharing what hasn't worked. And it's not just what hasn't worked. What did we learn from that? And what did we do from that? So um, that could be, uh, so we find that very successful, very engaging too. Um, uh, Danielle uh, Tashoro Mammers has said in the chat, I manage a network of scholars, many of whom are doing community engaged work and are excited about public scholarship. One challenge I'm having is articulating the broader social impact of these projects. Do you have any advice on communicating the impact of publicly engaged work back to senior leadership? So um, sort of uh, knowing what what knowing what knowing works and, and what difference it's made in broader society. Um, Marina, Juliet, Rebecca, who would like to address that? I can. It's a big question. Uh, this kind of harkens back. We actually just held a, ses a session this summer uh, that was a executive level public engagement work training uh, for folks across Canada and the United States with um, uh, some colleagues from the United States. And, uh, you know, your your network may not like to hear this, but the fact is that different stakeholders within the university have different priorities. And a lot of faculty are going to kind of cringe when they hear, oh, well, this is going to increase the institutional reputation. Oh, this is going to bolster our reputation with X, Y, Z. That stuff isn't what faculty want to talk about. But there is a strong case to be made for positioning this kind of work to senior leaders in that way. Basically, how are you solving the problems that they're dealing with? And those problems, you know, they're a long way from the academic mission sometimes. They are getting into that advancement and that sort of, you know, executive leadership element. So I think asking them to try to step outside why it's mattering to them and trying to consider uh, solving the problems of the of the leadership in particular i think uh, you know ultimately is is kind of the way to do that and considering how your university and your place can do that in a way that reflects who you are as well thanks rebecca just um keeping an eye on the time i'll go to the next question just before i ask justin to wrap up and uh, julian gillen says very fascinating session by the way thank you very much julia we're glad you're liking it. Her question is, I'd like to know more about how Marina and Memorial are evaluating their engagement activities. So maybe Marina, um, I'll throw it to you to say, how are you evaluating your engagement activities? Yes, that is the, I think, kind of a <clears throat> million dollar question. I think I, I kind of touched on it a little bit wet during my uh, my initial remarks is um, I think at the moment uh, we, at least here in my institution, um, we are kind of um, encouraged in a way um, to, to to kind of push and, and only like celebrate and evaluate things that bring in um, kind of a contribution that's often the financial beneficial to the um, to the institution, but I think we we need to um, have a broader um, look at everything that we do, um, and not only um, not only focus on on those activities that might be a little bit more like shinier. Um, in terms of um, evaluation, we are currently working on an evaluation, and I'll be very very kind of um, interested in, in learning a bit more about what Rebecca has done a bit more in detail. Um, uh, but I think, uh, yes, from, from our point of view, uh, we uh, we want to um, kind of see, try and 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 um, basically translate uh, the impact into something that is tangible, and that is something that's very difficult depending on uh, the type of impact, and the, the, especially with social sciences. Um, so definitely something that we're still working on at the moment. I'm I'm worried. I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have a, a very satisfying question. But if anyone else does, please do let me know because um, oftentimes, yes, we are stuck in the kind of like, how much money does this bring in? How many lives it has saved? Well, sometimes it doesn't bring in money, and sometimes it doesn't save lives, but it's still very important. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else or the panelists has a better a better answer, <laughs> but um, that was. Great, thanks, Maria. I'll just pause there. I put a link to a tool that we've recently um, collected or created and published from Research Impact Canada. But before, um, uh, as you look at that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to my impact buddy across the pond, Justin, to, um, to thank everyone and to let us know uh, what might be happening next. 
Thanks so much, David. Um, well, first, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our terrific speakers. Um, I've learned a great deal uh, and will take back to my own institution some of these. But I think from a from a UPenn perspective, um, I really like the idea of the confessional session where we when we hear about things that haven't worked. I think this is something that will benefit the whole community. And I'll certainly be recommending that to to, to UPenn. So uh, for all of our attendees, this is the second in a three part series of co-hosted webinars between Research Impact Canada and UPenn. And we have a third webinar, webinar in the series, uh, which is uh, due to take place in the next couple of months. Uh, and it's on the topic of establishing policy engagement and developing institutional memory in smaller organizations. Um, so do keep a look out for that and we'll be we'll be promoting it through through our usual channels. Now, if you wish to revisit the webinar discussion today, uh, we've recorded it and this recording will be made available on the Research Impact Canada's website uh, next month. So all of the um, all that remains for me to say is thanks very much to our speakers and to all of the uh, the staff who've helped us uh, put this together. Uh, your, your work's been terrific. And also to help the uh, also to thank the attendees um, who have contributed some great questions, and I hope that everyone's enjoyed it. And we look forward to seeing you in our third session. So, without further to do, further ado, have a nice evening if you're in the UK. Have a nice day if you're in Canada. Great, thank you, Justin. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.